Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, the Security Awareness Series, Episode 170. I am Chris Hadnagy, founder and CEO of Social Engineer LLC, social-engineer.org, and the Innocent Lives Foundation. And I've been hosting this podcast since 2009, when podcasts first started, and we had to do them uphill both ways in the snow. Anyhow, I'm joined by my trusty co-host, Ryan McDougall. Ryan, thanks for being here with me today. Thanks, Chris. Uh so I'm Ryan McDougall. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Social Engineer LLC. I'm also the lead open source intelligence trainer uh, for SECOM and taught at Black Hat, DerbyCon, private public trainings. I've been the I've been in the information technology field for about 24 years now, and uh, with the focus on the last nine years in adversary simulation and security awareness. So it's good to be here. You must have started when you were nine. Well, because you look young. You. Anyhow, this episode is sponsored by Social Engineer, social-engineer.com. You can check us out. I'm sure you know this. Everyone knows this. Every attack seems to be revolving around phishing, vishing, some kind of social engineering vector. How do people stay safe? How do you? How can you train your employees to actually recognize these things, report them properly, and keep your company safe from all the attacks we see out there? Uh, we have specialized services as well as fully trained team of social engineers that are certified being able to help you and your company realize how you can stay safe from these human vulnerabilities. You can check out the things on our newly released website at social-engineer.com. And if you're really interested in the topic of social engineering, you should join our Slack channel. Uh, we have over a thousand people in there every day talking about things like pretexting and phishing and vishing and the psychology behind social engineering. We even have a job board where uh, seven people have found employment at different companies uh, in the um, infosec field. Uh, lots of good announcements and things coming out there too. And of course, we want to give a shout out to Clutch. Check them out, pro-rock.com, the best rock and roll band on the planet Earth. And they give us their music uh, for the podcast. So we love those guys. And you want to support them. They're on tour right now. New album coming out soon. So you really want to check that out. If you don't know who Clutch is, shame on you. Go to <laughs> pro-rock.com right now. Go to Spotify. Um, you can listen to them. And while you're there on Spotify, you can click the little donate button because that goes right to the ILF, innocentlivesfoundation.org. Uh, Neil is on the board of that. And it's a wonderful charity that helps uh, protect children from the horrors of child abuse material, uh, stops child trafficking, and people who profit from uh, child sex abuse material on the internet. So please uh, check that out at innocentlivesfoundation.org. And the one last announcement, uh, you can check out some new training options on social-engineer.com. We just released a new APSE course and there'll be an OSINT course up there soon. Many people have been asking, so go and check out our new training options there. Now let's get to the important part, our guest today. Um, we're joined by Adam. He's currently the Chief Information Security Offer Officer for Simply Safe in Boston, Massachusetts, Got to find how the weather is up there. In this position and his previous jobs, Adam has had the responsibility of managing everything involving information security, risk and policy and procedures. He's currently an adjunct professor at Boston College in the Cybersecurity Policy and Governance Program, as well as an adjunct professor of IT in the MBA program at the School of Business at Providence College. Man, two professor jobs. We're going to talk about that. I don't know how you handle that. Outside of the office, he's a car and technology enthusiast as long as an avid reader. You know what that means, folks. Hiker, cyclist, and we don't want to mess with him because he knows Brazilian, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and he's a practitioner of that. So, Ryan, you can handle all the uh, violent, aggressive questions with Adam here today. But, Adam, thanks for coming on the show. We're really happy to have you. Thanks for having me, guys. Looking forward to it. And the weather in Boston is uh, not bad today. Oh. We're, in the, we're in the 50s and 60s. It's uh, not, not abysmal. That's nice. Not depressing. Yeah. Uh, 50s and Strive 60s is, is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, well, it looks sunny. That's why I was curious because it looked like you had sun coming in. It's not bad. Yeah. So, Adam, let's start off. How did you get in the industry? What started you off in, in information security? Yeah, so I have a I have a kind of weird career path. And, um, you know, this is one of those questions that I feel like I could answer in like 20 minutes. So I'll, I'll try to keep it really tight. But I started off in college and as a accounting and finance major, I lasted a whole semester <laughs> and went, this is not for me. I can't see myself being an accountant. And I switched to special ed. And the whole time in college, I had worked in the IT, you know, help desk, resetting passwords, fixing printers, doing things like that, kind of worked my way up. I was racking switches and installing access points. By my senior year, I was managing antivirus servers and handling GLBA, you know, questionnaire responses and all that good stuff. So when I graduated, um, I kind of didn't have anything lined up. And the CIO for Providence at the time basically said, hey, you want a job? <laughs> it's like, I I'd love a job. Nice. So I came on, got my MBA as a security analyst, and then just worked my way up from there. Security engineer, I was a 
a couple of CISO a couple times, an ISO, a you know VP of risk, a, a whole bunch of fun things like that. So um, been been doing technology, been se- doing security for for quite some time now. So that's that's interesting. I'm curious, what did you do in special ed? What was the what was the focus there? Uh, I taught mild to moderate uh, inclusive. So what that means is I taught in a classroom of just special ed students, um, you know, up to mild and moderate moderate disabilities in uh, in Massachusetts. And um, it's everything you'd expect. You know, how do we develop educational plans for these individuals that need a little bit extra help in getting them to be successful and, and, and you know, learn in the same capacity as, as everyone else? It must have been an interesting field, though, to help you when you got into InfoSec, because sometimes developing training for InfoSec could be very difficult. People have a hard time, some people have a hard time learning, like, what phishing is or vishing, and that background must have really helped you with with, uh, being able to accomplish those tasks. Yeah, and, you know, I kind of was at that crossroads in my career of, do I want to be a teacher or do I want to go into technology? And the decision ultimately fell down to, I could always go back to being a teacher, I think, but can I try and get into security in 20 years from now? I, it would have <laughs> totally passed me by, but to your point, you're right. I definitely lean on my education degree way more than I ever thought I would with establishing training and how we train and how people learn and how different individuals learn in different ways and how do we cater our training to make sure we've got you know, visual learners and auditory learners and we've got diagrams where we need to have them. Um, I, I'm, I'm definitely very reliant upon that. That is fascinating. So how do you, when you're developing training for, so you said you've been in a number of different companies and you've had all these different roles. Have you been a part of building up those security programs in those companies? And like, what are the differences that you, that you found in those different companies that maybe something that's consistent across all of them, or even the differences that can pertain to different industries? Sure. So I've built a couple programs now. This is my second or third program I've I've built from a, a security program standpoint. So that's you know everything, right? From multi-factor authentication up to um, you know training and how do we do SIM? You know how do we think about these things? So when I think about the different environments I've worked in, so I've I've worked in um, higher ed, technology, and finance, probably the the big three that that make up most of my career. Um, security is very different throughout them. And when I think about security in higher ed. A lot of it's, hey, does this thing work? Okay, great. Now, how do we make it secure? And when you think about security and finance, it's, hey, is this thing secure? All right, cool. Now, how can we make that thing work? <laughs> so it's really two kind of vastly different cultures. And the thing I try to drive home is exactly that aspect of culture is how do we make sure that we are a secure organization? How do we eat, sleep, and breathe security so that we're thinking about it in all of our decisions? And security is not just this police officer or this gate that you have to get through, it's, you know, kind of permeating throughout all the things we do. So a lot of the focus I drive on is exactly that from a culture standpoint. How do we make it in our blood and and organically to what we do as an organization that we're thinking about being a secure organization? Do you find that's a hard um, shift to get people to, to, uh, it's like maybe not the way I want to ask it, like, I don't want to. I don't want to. Bl- I don't want to blame people, right? I just want. I want to ask you. Like, you think it's hard to get people to to think that way? It's uh, it's hard to get people to think that way. It's easy to get you know, excuse my grammar, person to think that way. Uh-huh. So I think as you think about shifting the culture of an organization, you've got to think about we are taking a giant container ship and we're turning a container ship in the ocean. <laughs> which takes time and it takes a lot of different coordinated efforts, but it's very easy for you to go to the navigator and say, you know, 30 degrees West and like, okay, they got their task. You go to the engine room and say, you know, left rudder 20%. All right. They got their task. And you go to the, you know, whatever other part people on the boat, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously <laughs> not a, not a Navy man, um, but you go to everyone else on the boat and everyone kind of has their role. So as you kind of start to work on an individual basis and get people into that, you know, um, mindset of secure organizations and thinking about security and doing their task in a secure manner, you can really start to see the boat starting to, you know, shift and turn to where it needs to, to get to. So I'm, I'm kind of hearing that, y- are you tailoring your training per department, like specifically to the department as opposed to a kind of a generalized across an entire org? 
Yeah, so my methodology from a training standpoint is I I am tired of the old training that everyone is sick of, <laughs> of the once a year, go and watch this 30-minute video from 1987 of like, you know, are you aware of the Computer Abuse Act of 1987? <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay, great, that's helpful to me, but it doesn't do anything. So from a, from a training standpoint, I think about micro-training, right? How do we make it? prevalent how do we make it persistent how is it always you know in your face in small little chunks five ten minutes a quarter hit this hit this hit that hit this instead of once a year for 30 45 minutes so that's one major aspect the second one is is to your point ryan is how do we establish customized you know bespoke training and i have a different training deck for each department within an organization huh. the training we give to hr is on employee security and employee data and how do we protect this information and how do we respond to you know the rsa threat when they got breached with someone sending a recruitment email and then we talk to finance we talk about ap and ar fraud and abuse and how they're going to deal with compromises of that and how when i talk to customer service and customer success it's hey you might get a weird email from someone pretending to be a customer trying to get information out of you and how they might say, hey, I'm having a problem with my thing. Here's this Word doc that's got a beautiful macro in it that they want you to open. So we try and customize it as what are the attacks you are going to see within your position within the organization. So that's interesting because, it, it, I mean, it sounds like it's a ton of work because it seems like you're customizing that message based on the person, their role, what they might experience instead of just making this blanket, hey, here's what you're going to need for everybody. Yeah, there's, there's universal aspects to security, right? There are things that everyone should know. Phishing emails, social engineering, there's things that people should recognize from a security standpoint from, from threats. But what we try to focus on, that's, that's the bulk of the training. It's probably 75%. These are universal, good security things that are going to help you personally and professionally. And then the other 25% is, hey, what are the things that you do for your job that we need to customize and talk about? So it's not a... I won't, you know, I'm, I'll come clean, right? I'm not building customized, fully training for each department, but we've got about 75% really good universal content and about 25% of it tailored to those individuals and what they do specifically for the org. So I love that comment that you made about personally and professionally. Do you get feedback from <laughs> your users about how your training affects them outside of work? Yeah, we, th that's paramount. Right, you you need to make sure, especially today, everyone's personal life. I mean, we're all sitting in our homes right now, right? Everyone's personal and professional life is 100% intertwined. You might have some personal stuff on your work computer, you shouldn't, and you might have some, you know, work stuff on your personal computer, you shouldn't. <laughs> but the, everyone's life is intertwined, and we're seeing people compromising personal accounts to then exploit and break into professional accounts, and we're seeing that the other way around too. So. When you're building training, it's it's paramount to have a universal aspect of how this is going to help you personally and how it's going to protect you in your personal life so that you don't fall victim to a 419 scam personally and you don't fall victim to someone calling your house and saying, hey, we're the IRS, so we're going to come you know, kidnap your dog. Like <laughs> Those things that can help you personally, you're going to be able to recognize them in the professional, pro in the professional environment too. Yeah, that's, that's such an important message. Um, every time we talk to somebody from a company that um, that ends up making the information security training personal for their people. We always hear a similar message that they're, that the people that you're servicing, the people you're taking care of, truly uh, appreciate the things that you're doing because they take it home to their families, to their kids, to their spouses, to their parents, and they teach them those things. And then they feel better about being secure o overall. So I, I, I just, I always love hearing that message no matter how many times we hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the ideal goal, right? If someone comes back to me and says, "Hey, I had I saw your training last week. It was great. It was wonderful." Or, "Sorry, your training was terrible." Regardless, <laughs> but you know, my my father called me and he got a call and he recognized it and I was able to tell him about this thing. You know, but I got this weird piece of mail and I wasn't sure what it was. I was gonna send something back, but I decided to ignore it and throw it out. Like hearing that, like, yeah. "Hey, it helped me have a personal win," is you know phenomenal because that's what we're here for, right? I mean. It's great to work in a successful company and do successful things, but at the end of the day, like, I want people to be successful. I want them to be prosperous. I want them to, you know, be uh, be living be living good lives. That's, uh, that's the goal. Now, I, I assume that you know, Simply Safe is a pretty large company. So, how do you do this when you're talking about maybe hundreds or even thousands of employees? How do you 
how, how do you customize it so much to, to make sure it hits everybody in, in, the, in the way that will be best for them? Um, bribes and threats. Ah, that works. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of rapport makes the world go round. You know, if you can establish really good rapport with your fellow leaders within the organization, it's not so much of an ask when I say, hey, you know, so-and-so, can I join your team meeting for, you know, 30 minutes and I'm going to blather on about security for a little bit and I'll, I'll make it a little bit entertaining and, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll promise you I won't, you know, be a drag on your meeting, but when you've got that rapport, that ask just comes a lot easier, and, and that's the best way to do it, right? Have that organic discussion at these team meetings. Talk to people. Just be a human being. Um, we'll, we'll take you a lot further than you think. You know what I love about what you just said? It's that, that rapport with other leaders. Um, how important do you think it is that we approach security from a top-down perspective as opposed to a bottom-up Oh, it's it's immensely important. Um, I think about like I mean we've seen the security industry change, right? I mean I remember security 10, 15 years ago was like potentially a dude or a girl that was in the corner and they sometimes wore <laughs> shoes and maybe they didn't wear shoes and it was kind of like that weird person that no one wanted to talk to. And like we've come a long way from these these troglodytes and. It's incredibly important now, especially if you have a security leader, a CISO within an organization, to establish these inroads and this rapport with the other leaders at the organization at that level. Because when there's something important that needs to change or happen or information that I need to get out or I'm seeing something you know, not moving at the pace it needs to move at, it's a lot easier for me to work at that level and say, you know, hey, Bob, hey, Tim, hey, Sue, like, you know, we, we've got this thing going. It's really important to the organization. You know, we really got to get with the teams and make sure they understand the importance of this. And that will just, you know, percolate down throughout the rest of their teams and everyone will work at that level. But if you have that top level alignment on prioritization and you're aligned moving forward on what you need to get done, it's just way easier to make everything else happen. But if you're pushing up from the bottom and you're a lowly security engineer trying to like make organizational change at the highest lever, level, good luck. You know, I took offense to that because sometimes I didn't wear shoes to work. I just want you to know that, okay? Okay, maybe. I, I, I hate wearing shoes. Okay, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll long, as long as we're both included in that, I uh, sometimes wear flip-flops. I'm just going to say. Okay. We're security guys. I, you know, that's right. Um, okay, I got a really important question that I know someone right now listening to this is asking. Let's say I'm in a company where I don't have that beautiful thing you just said. I don't have the support from the top down, but I need it. I know I need it. Do you have any suggestions on how uh, I'm the security guy here and I need to get that support, how I can even start to do that? I think there's two things I think about. And one of them <laughs> is, a, is a prime candidate for this podcast, which is engineer your way, right? <laughs> um, but I, I think the, the, the primary one would be find your champion. Um, uh. You've got to find someone who can you can carry their pen you can they can speak for you at their level they can understand the importance of security if that's the cfo if that's the cmo if that's the chief people officer hr officer whoever it is someone you're going to need a big ally at that level because the fact of the matter is it's, it's just it's just too hard to try and steer that ship by yourself but if you can get the captain or you can get the navigator or you can get someone who has a key role in turning that ship and they can be your ally and your champion and your voice, you're going to be way more successful. So find that person, grab a lunch with them, build some rapport with them, understand who they are. I'm trying to avoid ways of social yeah. engineering them, but like become, <laughs> find that humanity contact with them to create that rapport and create that ability for them to speak on your behalf and help you, you know, get your message across and, and you'll be really successful or else again, you're just pushing this big boulder up the hill by yourself and, it's just going to be a really difficult battle. You, you need some allies. You, you got to build a team. Well, you're you're among friends, and social engineering is not always negative. So you can yeah. use social engineering techniques very positively. Yeah. yeah. What, what is rapport if not a appropriate level of social? It, engineering? It is exactly right. I mean, Ryan, Ryan and I were in the same thought process because I'm thinking, you know, you can use social engineering. Just don't manipulate the person. Like help help them see why being your champion for this is going to benefit them and the company and make everything better. 
that's a that's a wonderful thought because uh, too many times we have conversations with people, uh, you know, potential clients, and it's somebody in our space, you know, and they're they want to do the service so bad, but you know, somebody higher up is like, I don't want to spend money on that. We don't need to spend money on that, and they don't understand the value. They don't know why things need to occur. The InfoSec guys do. They're saying, we need this. I mean, this is our biggest form of attack. We're getting called every day. You know, we just lost this much money to a BEC scam. Like, we need this, but they're not getting that champion. So that's a really nice piece of advice to find that that person. And maybe it's not the the best person at first, but just it seems like you're saying you can climb that ladder and you can get that person. And that person may then help you find a better champion and so on and so forth. You can get to that top level. Yeah, and I'm, I'm reading a, a good book right now, um, which is, you know, good to great. And they talk about a lot of these companies and how they, they went from good companies to great companies. And one of the chapters is first who, then what. Hmm. And it's incredibly important, right? Establish the who. Who are the important people? Who are the leaders? Who are the people you need to get involved in this? And then what do we need to do? How are we going to do it? But first who, then what? And I think okay. about that a lot. That is nice. I like that equation. We're going to write that book down too for later. It's uh, Jim Collins, I think. Yeah, uh, thank you. Great. Excellent. So if you had to give, I don't want to put a number on it, but if you had to give like one or three different like action steps that you would say every company right now, I mean, looking at the world scene, looking at what's happening with ransomware and every day a new type of attack, what would you say that smart companies need to start focusing on right now? So I think for that, there, there's probably a couple things that an organization needs to be mindful of. And, and one of them is probably not the sexiest answer, but hygiene, cyber hygiene, like understanding good hardware, software, asset inventory is going to do miles of difference mm -hmm. for you compared to any of the, like the cool new hip technologies out there. If you know what your technology is, you know where your assets are, you know where your data is and who has access to it, it's way easier than protect it and when <laughs> spring for j comes out or spring for whatever and log for this and all these other new you know fun yeah. things that have little cute emblems come out <laughs> you already know where your systems are you know where that software's running you know where that service happens to be and you can go and you know evaluate it and understand it and perform your incident response in, in a much faster and better manner so i think that's that's probably the first important thing the second thing um is some sort of risk-based methodology You've got to know where your biggest risks are to your organization. Are those internal risks? Are those external risks? Are they operational risks, financial risks, market risks? Whatever it is, you've got to be able to maybe not, you know, quantify that risk, but like qualify that risk. Understand the quality of it. If is it a large, medium, small risk? And be able to understand where you're missing those controls and where you need to apply further controls to mitigate, transfer, do something with that risk. But it starts with that risk-based methodology and, and it starts with that that IT asset or you know asset and hardware and software inventory. I think those two things are are paramount for uh, for being successful. Okay, I got a comment and a question. First, I love the cyber hygiene thing because obviously I've never had that suggestion on the podcast before. And it's wonderful um, th to think about usually that happens after the catastrophe. So that's the worst time, right? It's like, oh no, we got hit. How many other servers can get hit by Log4j? And now it's, ah, oh, we need to figure that out. But having that ahead of time, beautiful, wonderful. Um, so thank you for that suggestion. Now here's my question. On the risk-based methodology, how do you suggest companies find out that risk? Because maybe they don't know. Maybe they think, I don't have any internal risk. But they don't know that for sure, right? So how do they find that out? Uh, they work out the best company in the world. Internal risk. <laughs> uh, I was who just, are you? What company is? I was just throwing that CISO? out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> do you need a CISO? Um, I'm in. <laughs> um, so yeah, sorry. To your comment, uh, I guess to address your comment first, and then to answer your question, the hygiene is something that's often overlooked. Everyone wants the cool, new, hip, sexy technology that's going to come in and make ransomware obsolete and this new thing is going to stop you know hackers dead in their tracks and it's like okay cool but like let's not forget fundamental baseball <laughs> like we still need to field ground balls we still need to you know pitch and catch and throw and hit and do the things we need to do and a lot of times that stuff is overlooked but the dollar you spend in a lot of the basic kind of hygiene stuff to make sure it's up to snuff and at the level it needs to be at is going to be 
a much better investment than buying the latest, greatest, newest, coolest, you know, toy on the block. So um, I think we're aligned there. And and on your other question of, of how do you do risk, I mean, interviews, like ask everyone everything. <laughs> ask the people in finance and people in HR and people in marketing and people in sales and whatever department they're in. Hey, what are the what are the things you're concerned with? And if you're not finding that fruitful, you got to play everyone's favorite game, which is how do you kill the company? <laughs> Play that game of like, what is the one thing that if it happened to your organization would close up the doors, turn the lights off and go home and then create that list and you've got your list of, you know, things. And some of those things might be, yeah, well, if we got hit with a giant, you know, level class five hurricane, like it would destroy a building and we'd be out of, out of luck. Well, all right, you've identified a risk. And your control for that risk is you need distributed data centers and you've got to go to somewhere that's out of the hurricane belt. And if your company, if your kill the company is someone comes in and they steal all of our intellectual property, all right, cool. You have now identified the risk of infiltration and crack open the miter attack framework and find out ways that people are going to get into your environment and start applying those controls. So interview people, have discussions, talk to them about what's important to them and their departments. And if all else fails, Sit down, get in a room, order some pizza, and play kill the company and find out what the biggest <laughs> risks are that way. And and do you suggest – yeah, yeah, I love it too. Do you suggest <laughs> having like risk assessments done on those things afterwards? Like they – I mean obviously you can't with the hurricane, but you know like the uh, the insider threat one, do you suggest uh, companies hire someone to then see – is that realistic? Could they come in yeah. and – yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, that, if that's a big risk to your organization, if you've gone through your risk assessment and you've identified, hey, we have a risk for if someone walked in off the street and they got physical access to our data center, like we're in, we're in a bad news territory. Well, how do you going to test that? Yeah. Hire someone to come in off the street and try and get into your data center. Or if your risk is, hey, we're concerned that we don't have really good authentication protocols for customers calling in and we could potentially give customer data to the wrong person, well, Hire someone to pretend to be a bad customer and call in and test your controls. Yeah. And if you already know your controls are bad, well, fix your controls first <laughs> and then hire someone to test them. But like testing those controls is, is super important. So I picked up a theme kind of on a previous thing that you were saying versus right now, which was when you're thinking about security awareness, you go out and talk to the departments and see and tell them what is a, what they need to protect. And then you also go to those same people in those same departments and try to determine risk. Are you merging those two conversations together to build that product that you ultimately deliver to them? Yeah, I, I don't know everything. <laughs> um, as much as I might think I know everything, I don't know everything. <laughs> so there's, there are things that are I'll call low-hanging fruit, which is I know that my finance team is going to be attacked by APAR fraud, where someone's going to try and put potentially through a malicious accounts receivable statement and try and get us to pay them. They're going to try and change vendor bank account information. I know those attacks. But what I might not know is when I meet with finance, they say, oh, we have this process where, again, I'm going to make something up right here on the spot, but we have this process where we... Um, we, we pay employees by, you know, tallying amounts up on an Excel sheet that everyone has access to. And like, I didn't know about that, but having that interview with them, I now know about this Excel sheet. I now know about the threat that could come from that Excel sheet. And me as a security professional am then responsible to say, Hey, maybe we want to limit who has access to that spreadsheet. And maybe we want to not do it in a spreadsheet, but do it in something else. But like, I need to understand what they are, what their processes are, how they do things. And then I can apply and help them build good sound control. So the training is is the 80-20, right? With the training, I'm going to hit 80% just because, you know, we read the news articles, we're up to date, we know security, I can probably get good amount of information transferred. That 20% is meeting with them, understanding their processes, understanding where they've identified risks, and then as a security professional, providing value, providing advice, providing input to make them better, more secure. And maybe the most important question is how much does jujitsu help you with security? <laughs> Zero. Um, oh, there's a fun thought, story behind man, that. I thought Zero. you were going to have there's a, good a fun story. story. <laughs> okay. I, I do. A, I do have a fun story, and I'm not going to say names just to protect the innocent. <laughs> if he's listening to this, he's going to kill me. But um, I have uh, knocked a fellow employee unconscious via. We were we were sparring. So it was on a mat. It was in a. It was in a. It was in a, a facility. We were wearing the appropriate garb. It was everything was was above board, uh, but uh, yeah. So I, I have you know 
choked a fellow employee out. Oh, I thought you were going to say he clicked on the wrong fish and then you, you know. No, no, no. Okay. You're that, that's good. Like a team meeting or something. Like, okay. yeah, team I, meeting. Don't oh, do no, that. No, that's no, a team no, meeting, no. right? This was, this, was, this was on a Saturday morning, <laughs> off hours, on a mat, coaches. It's the way our team meetings around. go, you know. Yeah, it's it's like, <laughs> Usually I'm choking one employee. No, no, that's not true. No, not, not true at all. Not <laughs> oh, that's no. great. Um, man, Adam, this, this has been awesome. And I, your actionable tips are just, uh, wonderful. Um, really, it's, uh, it's great to get them from somebody seasoned like yourself. So let's, um, l- let's talk about, we always ask these couple questions. Um, uh, first of all, if people want to stay in contact with you, cause you have a lot of really good thoughts, you have a lot of really good experience. Uh, what's the best way for people to reach out to you and stay in contact? Yeah, um, LinkedIn's a great resource. It's probably one of my only forms of social media. Um, I have a Twitter out there somewhere, but it's usually just used to yell at airlines and complain to <laughs> companies. Um, that's I basically all Twitter's good. good for. So <laughs> Yeah, that's all Twitter is <laughs> beneficial for. It has a surprising amount of open source intelligence, which is really weird. Yes. Twitter's kind of had a, a good spot for that. But um, LinkedIn's a great spot, and, and Simply Safe's hiring. If you're a talented engineer, a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, a Whatever it might be, um, we are always looking for for who, right? My, my previous content. Find the good people. Um, if you, we, we'd love to have you come work with us. Uh, Adam, so seriously, if you want to send me uh, links to any jobs you have, I'll post them into the Social Engineer Slack. Uh, right. We've had people looking for jobs all the time in there. So I will gladly post them Or you them can come into the out. Social Engineer Slack and post them as much as you want. You can. Cool. Yeah. 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 Um, but Send me an invite. Yeah. We'll have to, have to join. We will do that. Uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, okay. So we'll put a link to Adam's uh, LinkedIn uh, in the show notes. So if you want to follow and, and uh, chat with him, you can do that there. Now, most of us have not ended up where we are in InfoSec today without some help. Uh, so who would you say is your greatest mentor or greatest mentors that you have had? That is a really good question. Um, mentors are incredibly important depending on where you are in your career, I think. And earlier on in my career, you know, there are a lot of bosses that I had. Um, I don't know whether to name names or not name names that I want to leave people out, but, um, I, I can, I can name a couple of folks who have been really influential for me. So, so my first boss, um, Don Chattel, the ISO of Providence college, um, really great guy, helped guide me, get me started in my career. Second boss, Dave Sherry, the CISO for Brown University at the time, um, really taught me kind of how to work with intent and purpose. And then when I was at Brown Brothers, the CISO there, Walt Minsky, was a phenomenal guy. And, and I learned a lot about working in large organizations. And, and I think kind of as I've progressed in my career, it's shifted from like one specific maybe person or people to more of a support group mm-hmm. where I feel more of a community now where... I have a bunch of group, a group of CISOs and other professionals that I can leech, reach out to and say, hey, I'm dealing with this thing, working on this thing. How have you dealt with it? How have you resolved that? So I think of my mentorship or, or become being a mentee now as being a part of a support group and having, having that support network, which is really important. So I'd encourage you, find one or two folks in your career, maybe when you're early on, and then as you progress, start building out that network and that support network because you're going to be able to lean on that a lot more than just leaning on one person. That's awesome. And thank you for those names. It's great. Um, a lot of times when we get, uh, people to recommend or to talk about their mentors, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, people that aren't around anymore. <laughs> so it's nice to, that if someone's listening to this and they hear you mention them, that's going to really validate they're them. They're all alive. It's going to, I'm pretty sure they're all alive. I hope they're all, I hope <laughs> yeah. you guys are all doing great. Yeah. It's going to make them feel good, you know. Um, you said you're an avid reader in your bio, and uh, a lot of our listeners love to read. For the last 13 years of our podcast, we have been collecting um, lists of recommended books, and uh, sometimes they have nothing to do with the topic. They We've had people come on and recommend science fiction and other types of fiction books and other things like that. We don't care, but uh, we just we, we collect them all, and we put them on the social engineer book, uh, uh, book list. And you already mentioned one, Good to Great, which is awesome. So we're going to put that there. But are there other books that you think are just, you've read them and they changed you or you love them and you just want other people to, to read them? Um, I <laughs> I read nothing of like substance now. Um, <laughs> my, I, I feel like I'm reading so many white papers and articles on this and you know all these whatever out there that um, I don't get to, to read for fun as much anymore. But um, I just read The Hobbit and I'm rereading the Lord of the Rings series, which is phenomenal and I highly recommend I'm going to read that. And then from a good science fiction series, um, The Witcher series is really good. 
it uh, it'll ruin the Netflix show for you. <laughs> so be mindful of that. But the series itself is is phenomenal. But those are those are probably my my favorite. Um, I, uh, that I read. That's great. But, uh, I love it when we get anything. No, I love it when we get books that have nothing to do with our topic. And that happens every now and then. People will come in and just recommend. We had someone recommend a children's book once. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, and then people write in like, hey, that's great. I bought that for my kids. So. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's funny because like we you know when you're in college and you're you're getting your, your undergrad and your grad and whatever it might be, like you don't read for fun. You read because you have to read right. textbooks and content. And I feel like for my professional job, like I'm reading news articles and blog posts and white papers and this and that to kind of try and stay relevant. So the last thing I want to do at like, you know, nine o'clock at night <laughs> when I go to bed is pick up and read like, you know, the whatever, how to, how to deploy an enterprise fire. Like, <laughs> just, I don't want that. I want to read like nonsense, science fiction, take me to another planet. Let me, you know, lose track of time for a little bit and then, you know, find some joy in reading. Okay, first of all, I'm thoroughly impressed that you go to bed at nine o'clock. Thoroughly impressed. I'm an early, I'm an early to bed person. Like Nine thirty, I'm out. I, I am, I am jealous of of your commitment and self control. Uh, maybe that was the whole thing I've learned from this podcast. Forget everything else. Yeah. That is the one lesson I <laughs> go to bed at nine thirty. I'm utterly jealous. <laughs> yeah, not go. get your sleep. You, sleep. Sleep's irreplaceable. I'm, I'm the biggest sleep proponent. Get, get a solid eight or nine every night, and you will, it will change your life. I don't even Literally know what eight or nine feels like. Oh man, if I can get I'm five, happy with I'm four happy. or five and that's <laughs> and I'm not happy with it. Believe me, I, 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 my trainer says the same thing you say. He's like, you, you gotta fix it. He says, he says, literally, you do that. That will change everything about your health program. It's critical. And you feel better. You, yeah. everything, everything, everything is better. And, and when I do get it, I notice my recovery, like on my whoop, it tells me, man, you got 92% recovery and I know I feel better that next day. Yeah. But then work on it. Make effort, stride. I know, man. I know. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, Adam. All right. Um, Adam, this has been a really enjoyable conversation and uh, really actionable. I, I appreciate it so much, you coming on the show. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I had a, had a great time. It was really a uh, really great chat with you guys and answering some questions and talking about some uh, obscure topics, too, mm -hmm. on the uh, on the side here, too. And it's uh, it's great to, to hear someone like you, especially because, you know, the place you work now is Simply Safe is a security company for home security. So it's really important that somebody very uh, like-minded like you that takes this so seriously is running security at a company that handles keeping people's homes safe. So uh, it's really nice to to have that conversation with you and see see your thoughts on this. So thank you for that. Yeah, we've, we've got a great mission, you know, every home secure. And it's what we strive to do. We want to protect our customers. We want to protect their homes, their businesses. It's core to our value and what we do as an organization. And um, everyone takes it to heart there. So it's a, it's a really great organization, and I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, th thank you for joining us, and thank everybody for joining us uh, this month on, on the Security Awareness Series podcast for Social Engineer. Next month, we'll be joined by ethical hacker Ted Harrington. So we'll talk to you then, and we'll see you next time. See you.